Good morning. Good morning. Um, we're going to talk about uh, climate transition. Um, and uh, the big question is uh, the U.S. eating our lunch on, um, on climate transition. Prime Minister uh, Justin Trudeau's government last month revealed, a, I think it's fair to say, a substantive uh, response to the U.S. Inflation Redu Reduction Act, 80 billion or so over 10 years, add uh, the cost, the fiscal cost of measures, uh, other measures in recent years, you can easily uh, take the, f the federal fiscal cost to above $100 billion on, um, on climate transition. And over the next uh, 30 minutes, we're going to try to unpack some of that, uh, some of those measures and, and talk about the challenges. Um, but I think it's still fair to say, now even a month after the budget, that the government continues to be dogged by this one nagging question. Have they done enough? And is the U.S. still eating our lunch? So I'm going to start off with that question. I'm going to start with you, Roman. Uh, have, they been, have they done enough? Uh, thanks, Theo. Um, very catchy title. I would say, uh, no, they're not eating our lunch. And the budget in and of itself wasn't the one piece that was going to change the, the course of events in this entire uh, journey, so to speak, energy transition and decarbonization. Um, I think uh, to get to the punchline, uh, it's a fairly balanced playing field, if you will. Is it competitive? Initially, when the IRA was announced, a lot of our practitioners were like, ooh, that's a big one. Okay, how are we ever going to keep up? But and when you step back and look at what the IRA was, uh, it's kind of on a couple levels. One was it was a continuation of the reshaping of industrial policy in the United States, which was in conjunction with the CHIPS Act and the JOBS Act. So that was kind of the first part of it, it as a continuum. And the second part of it was the United States making a statement to the world that we're very serious about decarbonization, we're going to get at it. And in the world of carrots and sticks, lots of carrots to, uh, to get uh, industry, uh, U.S. industry, and uh, frankly global industry focused on that. Um, the response in Canada was, maybe it's just their Canadian nature, it's like, oh, how are we going to keep up with that sort of thing? But we already had a lot of very strong policies in place to finance uh, the transition. You know, renewables in Canada have been a very strong industry for a very long period of time. The issue is, how do you incent the new technologies? Carbon capture, hydrogen, biofuels, battery storage are, are the keys to decarbonizing um, the globe over the course of the next 30, 40 years, uh, so to speak. So. We were already there. The budget in and of itself was a bit of a catch-up, but we had the fall economic statement, which made a lot of progress. The budget made a lot of progress, and I, you know, I'm not going out on a limb saying there will be other statements and other policies developed over time that will kind of evolve as technology evolves and as the global marketplace evolves. But you know, to answer your question, it's uh, uh, decarbonization transition is a very local type of response. You know, in, in Canada, we have our own issues to get to net zero than the United States. We may touch on that later, but it's, it is a different type of equation that way. Yeah, I, I guess that's where, that we'll be talking about oil and gas at that point, I think, yeah, uh, what, so. what you're getting at, Roman. But uh, Lisa, what, what did you like about the, the plan? What did you like about the, uh, the budget uh, as far as climate transition is concerned? What I liked is the recognition that there has to be a response to the competitive nature of the IRA. So from a business perspective, at least they're getting it. And it was a large part of the budget too, it was a significant portion of the budget. Um, for example, if you're sitting in universities and colleges, you were not happy with that budget because there was nothing in there for R&D in universities. All of the resources have gone into this one specific area because we have to meet the challenge from the United States. So I think what was good was the recognition of it. I think, as Roman points out, it was a really good start. It's a continuation from the fall economic update, but to pick up on what Janice Stein just said, look, it's all about execution. Devil's in the details, and Roman can tell you that clients are waiting to see exactly how this is gonna shake out so that folks at CIBC could do the analysis and tell them which way this is all gonna go and, and how well you're gonna do or not gonna do depending upon where you choose to put your capital. I mean, the competition is to make sure that capital allocation remains in Canada and that tech companies are supported in Canada. And will at least it's a start. I don't know if it's enough, but I, I give a thumbs up to the government on at least going as far as they have. Mm. They, they've essentially um, uh, decided to take a multi-track approach, um, the famous pyramid or yeah. triangle uh, in, the, in the budget, you know, with a 
regulation, carbon pricing at the bottom, and then uh, strategic financing and targeted programming. You, do you think that that's the right approach? Do you think a multi-track approach is the way to go? I appreciated the triangle. By the way, <laughs> the triangle came out at the time of the Oscars, so all I kept thinking of was the movie Triangle of Sadness, if anyone has seen <laughs> the movie. But nonetheless, it's not the Triangle of Sadness. It was actually extremely beneficial, and I, I, when I, I saw it, I screenshot and I sent it to Roman. I said, this is what we need to show clients, because prior to this budget document, it was kind of like clients coming in and saying, well, how, where do we fit in, and where's the SIF, and what does goes here, and can you stack? And I think them just laying out in a pictogram what the policy looks like was a really good thing to do. And I, and I appreciate it. So you can kind of figure out where you want to go. Um, I do think, though, that it would be great to get from the government some guidance as to what they value. Because right now it's all about EVs, which is fantastic. But CCUS, I mean, if you take a look at the CIBC equity research, CCUS is really what needs to be done in order to hit our decarbonization. Yeah, I'll, but bad, bad ending to that movie, by the way, but I'll just leave yeah, it aside. I, um, I think I'm a little more optimistic. No, where Lisa, to fill in on Lisa's comments, it's a series, it's, a, it's about the priorities to, you know, we've got to get to 440 metric tons, megatons rather, by 2030. Um, U.S. has their own target as well. 25% of emissions in the U.S. are transportation, roughly. 25% are power. Canada... 25% roughly are transportation, 28% is the production of oil and gas, and 8% is power. We already have a green grid, so it's not a very heavy lift to decarbonize our, our uh, energy uh, grid, whereas in the States, it's the job, right? And so um, when looking at that carbon capture, jumps over, uh, leaps over rather, uh, the other priorities in order uh, to get to our goals, can Canadian goals, so let's be focused here, we're talking about Canada, and for Canada to achieve its goals, not so much competing with the United States on who's got the shinier programs, it's like we've got to get to 440 by 2030. And I think that's where a lot of the narrative and, and insecurity about where is Canada on that front. I think we are fairly focused. You know, we, we've got a federal program, but we also have fairly strong provincial responses. And I think those are going to surface a bit more over time as well as to how, you know, the, the Western province are responding on carbon capture, which is a top priority. I mean, I don't know where you where you stand on um, you know your, the confidence in cutting emissions by forty percent over the next uh, um, seven years, I guess. Uh, but one criticism that I've heard and uh, you know about the plan and about the budget is that there wasn't anything kind of concrete in, in terms of oil and gas. You have the elephant in the room, which is the caps on emissions um, on, on carbon capture. There wasn't anything new in terms of a direction. Uh, there aren't many people out there who believe that uh, that the oil and gas sector can can really contribute as much as um, the government is hoping. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I think the um, it's a work in progress, and uh, I would say, you know, the, you know, optimistically, to have it to get to that point, we need some concrete. We need the real numbers, right? We need to get going on contracts for differences, as, as for an example, and that's just being established now through the Canada Growth Fund and what PSP is going to be doing to manage that. Uh, we need to know how those contracts are going to work. We have projects ready to go. We have clients ready to go uh, with carbon capture uh, facilities and projects in, in Western Canada, but, you know, we'll, we'll come out east as well in terms of industry, but we need some certainty in that regard. Um, to some extent, and I've heard the narrative uh, and, and if you get really into the details, and that's what we do, is really you know, sit in a room for hours and think these things through with clients. Um, if you have a contract for differences regime, obviously uh, in conjunction with a carbon price regime, that's permanent because it is a contract, whereas in the United States, you've got investment tax credits, production ta uh, in investment tax credits that are 12 years in term, 12 years. So you, this better work over a 12 year span. Uh, and, you know, there is some risk to that. Um, so I'm not saying the Canadian regime is less risky, but if you're hearing what I'm saying, there is a way of looking at it that the Canadian construct is, elite. you can be optimistic about that, but it has to kind of get going. Yeah, so the budget response was basically two tracks. One track is towards our decarbonization goals, and that's where you get into the CCUS stuff. And then the other track is about being part of the new supply chains of the future, and that's why you saw... Um, the efforts with respect to EVs and critical minerals. And the Prime Minister's in New York today talking to 
talking to business about critical minerals, which is a really important file for us as well. So both of those, I think, were well covered off in terms of how we responded. It was more of a focused response. But I, I'm going to come back to it again. I mean, clients are ready, either in oil and gas, in power, or in industry, to get going on abating their carbon. And it means it has to have negotiations at the table to see what it all looks like, because we don't have that absolute clarity. The numbers haven't settled so that, you know, folks at CIBC can crunch them for clients. You're both investment bankers. Um, if the government... He's an investment <laughs> banker. I'm a former politician. But it's been, it's it's okay. been three years. It's You're in the club. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> um, the government calls you in uh, looking for advice, specific advice on the contracts for differences. What, what advice uh, would you give them in terms of rolling this out, designing it? Look, I think it's, uh, you get into the weeds pretty quickly on that. Is it on a gross amount? Is it on a net amount? Is it, you know, the, um, what is the amount? How much are you allocating? Right now, that's all a, a little out there. I think uh, we have a lot, I know we have a lot of clients that are ready to go with projects, and so good for them. There are a lot of projects that, you know, are still on the drawing boards or in the minds of our clients, and it'll, the, the economics uh, will dictate whether they go ahead with that or not. And so having those numbers out front uh, will will dictate where they go. Once again, uh, it is such a priority for Canada to abate its carbon, abate its carbon emissions. And you know, as as I mentioned earlier, a lot of that is around the production of oil and gas. Which, you know, be it resolved that in the to, to 2030, that's still going to be a very very viable business and beyond, obviously. Um, and, and you know, apropos the conversation prior to this, can, you know, energy security is is something that. I think is is surface that you know, uh, is got there's consensus about that, so to speak. That um, these projects need to uh, um, need to be supported, and that could grow. So you know, I'm not speaking. I mean, obviously, on behalf of the government, 15 billion is a bit of the marker now, but we'll see where that goes because uh, you know that urgency may pick up over time. And are contracts for differences a necessary condition for for the oil and gas sector to? you know, contribute in a serious way to re reduction in greenhouse gas emissions? Is it a necessary condition? Can we do it without it? Uh, you could do without it, but there'd be a great degree of risk and then the projects wouldn't get off the ground, right? There's a political overlay here as to carbon taxes and the price of carbon. And uh, without that certainty, they're not really financeable projects. Um, Lisa, is the government on the right track to ensuring indigenous communities are um, fully engaged in the transition effort? I hope so. Um, one of the things that we do see when we're working with clients is that there's a desire both in terms of Indigenous leadership and in terms of the companies themselves to have participation in the projects with Indigenous economies. And the issue is the difficulty of putting up that equity. And Alberta really has shown the way in terms of how projects can work when you have the balance sheet of the province to support um, the Indigenous uh, First Nation or the Indigenous group to participate in a really important project. And I, I just fundamentally believe that, um, you know, last night we had, we had these small dinners, and one of the things that we talked about was that the reality is, is that all decarbonization in this country is really going through rural and remote areas when you think about it, and First Nations lands. And as a result, all of those folks do have to have a say in it, and more particularly in the case of Indigenous nations and peoples, they should be part of the economic reconciliation, and there's a willingness for it. But again, it comes back to the government having to have the right product to help with that. Now, I'm heartened that they have a committee, that they're looking into it, um, but you know, 1,500 people gathered this week in Vancouver for the First Nations Major Projects Coalition Conference, which started you know, about you know half, half a dozen years ago in, uh, in the basement of a Delta. I mean, it's amazing to see how far it's come and in the interest in these projects, but you do have to have government involvement in it, at least at this point in time, until the nation becomes far more self-sufficient and they gather up more resources and they have more investments to allow them to make their own investments. But for a lot of them, it's about getting that first boost. But uh, I might add though, for, for having been in this industry for a long time, um, it is real. You know, having the Indigenous communities at the table is 
a very viable aspect to these projects. It's not an add-on at the end or something. It is the you know, it's there. We have we have actual examples of success and deals getting done. And, uh, the, and with every deal that gets done, there's a path to clarity as to how these deals get done because, you know, our, our clients and you know ourselves when advising and looking at you know getting something through to fruition, there's that unknown that might have existed in the past that is now getting as I, as I just mentioned getting clear all the time as each transaction gets done. So I'm very optimistic that this is part of the Canadian identity as it relates to um, getting deals, uh, getting very large infrastructure projects off the ground. You mentioned that the government has a key role here, uh, uh, but also is there a role, a major role for the private sector or private finance? I mean, what role does, uh, do banks, for example, uh, what, is there a market opportunity? I think so. Um, and I can tell you that even this week, there are lots of private capital groups that are interested in the indigenous space and how they can be helpful and whether or not they can do lending into the space. And there's a lot of, of uh, there's a lot of stuff that has to be coordinated and negotiated and, and there has to be a trust built. Um, you just can't off the mark say, here's your financial product and this is the way it's gonna go. It only comes through the leadership of the indigenous community that you're working with to understand what it is they want. And you're, you're seeing banks get into it more and more. We've got into, this topic more and more hosted a dinner last night uh, featuring JP Gladu, which was really yeah. important in terms of bringing together our clients with with indigenous leadership because as is as is pointed out I mean it shouldn't be one room of indigenous leaders saying how are we going to get this done and one room of Canadian business saying how are we going to get this done it's got to be everyone together so we're hoping that we can help facilitate that um, I want to pivot to hydrogen um, how optimistic are you that um, Canada uh, can um, start uh, being a major player in hydrogen trade to Europe or to Asia in the next uh, 15 years? Quite. Um, you know, I would say there's two parts to that. One is, you know, we, we already have uh, hydrogen projects primarily in the East Coast, uh, you know, in various stages of development and that is to uh, go to the European market, and the demand in the European market is there. But uh, if you break down the, the whole hydrogen issue, there are a lot of incentives that are being promoted to create the supply of hydrogen. Long list, look, et cetera. It's the demand for hydrogen that is the issue domestically, and can we create a, a, a domestic uh, hydrogen economy where choose your usage, you know, automobiles or um, uh, um, cement, heavy industry, et cetera, will they be using hydrogen? Right now, that's a little uh, unproven, whereas in Europe, you know, for a variety of reasons, primarily the geopolitics of what's going on right now, that is going full steam ahead. So as producers of it, with the resource, we have, you know, obviously uh, the green hydrogen is, is a very strong uh, uh, asset of ours and we're able to produce it, then we're able to get that off the ground. So that's, I'm optimistic from that perspective. It's still a little, the, you know, the, the, the goalposts are quite wide in the future as to how quickly that'll evolve domestically for us here. Mm -hmm. uh, is, uh, back to, have they done enough, have they done enough on this? I mean, we've got the, uh, the, the investment tax credit uh, plus um, the, the tax credit that was announced in the budget for hydrogen to ammonia as well. I mean. Is uh, you know is the um, fiscal framework sufficient? I think so. Yeah, you know, apropos my earlier comment, I think the supply side of it to incentive development is there. You know, obviously from and green hydrogen implies the green part being the production of electricity, and from a renewables perspective, very competitive framework that way. Um, and then the various tax credits are competitive with uh, the United States. Uh, you know, like uh, the thing with hydrogen is um, you can kind of make it anywhere. If you've got, you know, a source of green energy and uh, water, uh, you're pretty much making hydrogen. So it's very local. And so where is it competitive and where can you ship it from uh, economically? And I would argue, you know, in, in, for example, in Atlantic Canada, where we've got quite a bit of activity, that's going to get off the ground. Uh, Lisa, um, you talk about this all the time, streamlining impact assessment and permitting. Um, you know, that's going to be critical. Uh, if Canadian projects are going to be uh, competitive on a global um, yeah. uh, scale or compo global stage. Uh, the government in the budget uh, promised that it will um, outline a plan by the end of this year. 
to make the process more efficient? Are you confident they could do it? And do we even have eight months to wait? So, uh, it is so difficult to get projects moving in this country, regardless of the political stripe. Regardless, it's the same thing all the time because projects can find, I guess, bumps along the way within the bureaucracy that causes it to not be able to move as quickly as possible. So I commend the government on saying that they're going to prepare an outline for a plan that they may implement. <laughs> I wish the government had said, we are deputizing a group of four deputy ministers from the relevant ministries to come together and pick a project and shepherd it through from beginning to end in a period of time that lines up with decision making for capital deployment in this country. That's what I wanted to hear. I want to see that kind of SWAT team focus on getting at least one of these projects done. And I think that will just set the tone and some of the uncertainty that we see creeping into decision making and financing decisions will be alleviated by the fact that we have proven we can do a project. I actually think it's our secret sauce because I think the United States has a lot more problems with getting permitting and processing done than we do in Canada because we have the ultimate power at the end of the day to do what I said, deputize the deputies, put them together, give them a timeline and the resources they need to make it happen and make it happen. And I know that they can. I know that they can do this. Um, it's just a matter of, uh, of political capital and political will. But are you confident that they, could, they will do it? I don't know. I, well, I think I, I have a lot of time um, for Jonathan Wilkinson, and I think he is, he is sincere when he recognizes the fact that there's prob problems. But what you have to recognize in a government is that it's not just one stakeholder, it's many stakeholders. And it's a minority government, and there's an election coming. You know, I can excuse away it all. That's why I'm saying you need political will and political capital to get it done. It, if I may add, it's also a little free form. This isn't building another mine or putting another oil well in the ground. This is new technology, right? Carbon capture, you gotta capture the carbon, it's gotta be somewhere. Um, you need, uh, there's all kind, like, there's a lot of technological risk to where we're going, so it, you know, it's gonna be a bit of a slope, curve if you will, to get to these. We haven't heard of any projects not getting off the ground, let me put it that way. It's just, you know, you hear, this rhymes with condo developers saying I can't get permitting, et cetera. Like, it, it's, it gets done, it's a bit painful at times, uh, but I think everyone, to, to Lisa's comments, the will is there, and things have been getting done. It just may feel bumpy along the road, but I don't think it's a particularly Canadian thing. I think you hear this in a variety of jurisdictions. Um, the government still claims it's taking a market-driven approach, um, but when I look at the budget, I see um, uh, very much you know, whatever you want to call it, industrial policy, um, a government that's inserting itself in a big way um, into, um, you know, uh, a major um, uh, economic initiative here. Are you confident that the government has the capacity, the know-how, um, to be able to pull this off? Is this something that um, the federal government um, can do? Uh, I, uh, I think we have no choice but to think that to be honest. I mean, the reason why the economy is transitioning is because we collectively had made a public policy decision that we are going to transition to net zero by 2050. So therefore, you have to use all the tools that you can to get there. And as a result, you are seeing more government intervention. But there has to be, because government made the decision to insert themselves into the market with a public policy decision. Because give if you just let things the way they were, we'd continue to pump carbon in and we would continue to use oil and gas, but we've decided not to do it. So to move the market out of that comfort zone into a less competitive place, you need to be able to insert, and that's what they're doing, so. Um, for, forgive me for asking you to put on your conservative hat. I never uh, take it on. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think if a conservative government were, if conservatives were to come to power, how do you think they would deal with this issue, given that the fact that the government needs to, as you said, 
play such a big role? I can't predict, but what I do know from talking to my conservative colleagues is that they too want to see development of technology. They want to see projects like carbon capture and story to move forward. They are conservationists by, by name. They do believe fundamentally in natural, natural adaptation. And I think you'll see that. And you'll see support for technology and for jobs. And, and it's not going to be a complete 180 from the path that we seem to be on. Because one could say that that budget looked a little bit progressive conservative. Um, Trust me, I sit next to Lisa. Yeah, we should one. Okay, that. John Manley shaking his head. <laughs> except for the fact, except for the fact that they completely blew the deficit side, the fiscal side. I get it, John. I get it. I know. But you know what? So did the Ontario government. So, and they are progressive conservative. Um, we have uh, time for one more question, um, Roman. Um, in um, her budget speech. Um, Finance Minister Christian Freeland said, we are in the midst of the most significant economic transformation since the Industrial Revolution. Do you agree? Yes, uh, although is it the Industrial Revolution or some have said since the invention of the wheel? Like it's <laughs> the biggest, sh or the Marshall Plan, whichever. It is, uh, it just wrap your mind around, you know, the amount of capital that's got to be allocated to retooling all our sources of energy, our modes of transportation, you know, et cetera. Um, sources of refrigeration in a grocery store, all those things. So yes, um, and uh, to your question earlier about is the federal government equipped? Look, it's changed, it's changed the nature of who you're going to have in government, not, not politically elected, maybe even that, but it's really the expertise you're gonna need to have in these departments. Uh, energy transition, and the re retooling of the economy, and you know, I think the, you know, the Biden administration's done a pretty good job at articulating like, this is a, the, you know, they've used it for political purposes, but this is you know, re reframing of the industri industry in the United States. Um, it really does lean much more heavily on government participation than anything else we've ever seen. It goes back to those post-war type of days. You want to use that analogy where the government. Um, doesn't necessarily regulate it, but these are big projects with a lot of money involved, you know, a lot of money involved, and how does that all fit in the scheme of things? Because right now you've got this big, you know, playing board or risk board, and you know, this is where this goes, this is where that goes, and those are, this, you know, that genie doesn't go back in the bottle once you've made that decision as to where the projects go. So, yeah, I believe, uh, you know, comments made earlier, that the will is there, uh, the thought process is correct, um, it's just going to continue to evolve. You know, this conversation a year ago would have been entirely different. And three years ago, we wouldn't have had it. Yeah. So, you know, let's see where we are a year or two from now. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, yeah.